Rashitsa. That's the best you're getting out of me. <laughs> welcome to welcome to episode number 469 of the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast. Looking back on a nil-nil draw with Wolves at Carrow Road, which Norwich finished feeling reasonably disappointed that they hadn't taken another three points, but seven from a possible nine and beaten in three and some good early signs under Dean Smith. I'm your host, Dave Freezer. We also come to you, as ever, in association with Future Radio 107.8 FM, alongside Paddy Davitt and Connor Southwell, to look back on a on a pretty eventful game on a horrid day. We just got absolutely soaked walking up the uh, Round Road Hill to our uh, to our office. But on the whole, Pad, despite uh, uh, you know maybe a nil nil draw on the face of it not seeming too exciting, I, I think everyone's feeling pretty good about this one. I think you should treat us to another burst of Rashid so much. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to struggle to get that out of our heads all night, aren't we? <laughs> it was very yeah. good from the um, from the fans to come up with that one. It was very innovative, yeah. Uh, as is Norwich under Dean Smith at the minute. And uh, again, you know, more than value for a point today and probably should have got more. But mentioned a man there. He said in his post-match interview he'd probably... On the balance of last week, his first game against Southampton may be fortunate to get the, the three points, given how good Southampton were in the first half. So if they maybe got two they didn't deserve last week, possibly two that they could have got today have gone begging. So if the net effect is they're probably where he feels they should be after two games under him, then I don't think too many dispute that. Four points from two very encouraging performances as well um, particularly both second halves they, they were very good again today in the second half really drove forward and, and ultimately Wolves will be probably feeling the fortunate of the two sides that they, they got anything from that game and a Wolves team who at kickoff uh, started in six, top six in the table five wins from seven that is the measure of where Norwich are now looking to aim for and uh, yeah huge, hugely encouraging hugely uh uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Hugely uplifting as well. That uh, you know, Southampton wasn't just you know the first day in the office. Ultimately, for Dean Smith and the players wanted to impress him. It looks like there could be some real substance now building with him and Craig Shakespeare on the training pitches at Colney. But ultimately, a group of players who now look like they believe yes, they can a compete and possibly b stay up in the Premier League. So great base to build from going into obviously we'll part that for now but going into a huge game against Newcastle on Tuesday night yeah there was a good stat from the BBC before the game which said that Wolves had taken 16 points um, from the last seven games only Chelsea and Manchester City had managed as many in that time frame so they'd gone up to six you know they'd been playing well at the start of the season but they hadn't quite been getting the results so this was, uh, I'd said before the game that I'd have been happy with a draw. The big thing I was looking for today, were to, to, and I tweeted this, were, I wanted to see a consistent performance because we hadn't seen Norwich perform over 90 minutes at all this season, I didn't feel. And you wanted to start seeing some signs of the impact that Smith was making. And as you were pointing out to us in the first half, Connie, you could really see how they were pressing and further up the pitch, couldn't you? Yeah, I, re I really enjoyed watching them, to be honest. Obviously, I, was, I wasn't at the game last weekend against Southampton. So for, for me, this was kind of the first time I've got to see Norwich City mm, under yeah. Dean Smith. And um, yeah, the moment you're alluding to in particular was it was a throw in, but essentially in, in, in Wolves right back position. And every single Norwich City player bar Tim Krull was, was in Wolves half. That's that's how high they were pressing them. I think they actually won the ball and, and, and created a chance from that. So um, yeah, I, I mean, you could, you could use several words. I mean, there's much more intensity to their play. Um, I think there's a... Uh, as Paddy said, a real belief now, not just flowing out of them, but out of the supporters who I thought were, were excellent today. Um, and it, it, it is beginning to look like a team that is capable of getting Premier League results. And uh, they, they've done so today. And I was, I was thinking actually on on that very wet um, walk back, you compare this nil-nil to the ones they got under Daniel mm. Farker against Brighton and uh, Burnley. Um, those always felt like Norwich were kind of on the ropes and clinging on. Well, well this was a game that, as, as we said, they deserved to win, probably should have won. But as Paddy says, given the, the balance of the last two games was, was probably a fair result. So, um, yeah, I think they look a better coach team. They're quite fun, I think, is, is probably a good way to, to describe it as well. But also very effective, um, as you say, and very consistent. And um, if they can now produce this level of performance, then, then I think we're going to see them give the vast majority of teams a game at this level. Um, Wolves, as you said, very good mm -hmm. team, individually very capable. 
but Norwich more than matched them for, for large portions of that game, particularly in the second half where they really penned them in. And um, Yeah, if, if that's going to be the case, then I think we're in, in for an enjoyable sort of um, ride, whether, whether that culminates in Premier League survival or not. I think um, this looks like a Norwich side capable of just chipping away, of getting points, of being a bit more consistent. But as you say, there are, there are just slight tweaks that he's made to their off-the-ball structure and how he's coached them to chase the ball and hunt in packs. And, um, and I think that helps get the fan side on, on side as well. So, yeah, I, I feel much more positive about Norwich City having seen them under Dean Smith for the first time today than probably throughout any of the 10 games that I saw them under Daniel Farker, to be honest. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Wolves, the quality they've got, Neves in particular, but Matinho, Jimenez, they're bringing Adama Traore off the bench. He would be the first name on the team sheet for Norwich. There's absolutely no doubt about that in my mind. But the little bits and pieces that you sort of hinted to there, Connor, like McLean pelting back to win a throw-in, Williams getting his foot in, just those little moments that get the crowd on side there. It almost feels silly that it, it, those things like that. Gilmore did it in the first half, didn't he? When you go and snap into a tackle, make sure that someone doesn't get away from you and it gets the fans on side. And that whole atmosphere felt better today. It felt more united. Now, Pad, we're, we're still in the early stages, obviously. We're forming early judgments on, on the work of Dean Smith and Craig Shakespeare and, and what they're putting in place. And for them to be successful, for them to get survival this season, it is all about consistency and over this nine or ten games through until the FA Cup third round, we really need to see a consistent flow of points, but also more consistent displays like we saw today and and some of last week. Does it feel, again, that it's still, still early, That because it's difficult to look back on, what, uh, on the uh, first 11 games and not be sort of disparaging of what of Farker's work almost. You know, we've all said the positives and, and things like that. But it just feels like on the early signs of things that you've maybe got a manager who is, or a head coach, sorry, who is better suited to a survival scrap than someone who's uh, very good at getting teams out of the championship. Yeah, I mean, that's a conclusion you, you would have, you would, you, would, you would find it difficult to, to dispute ultimately the way you've mapped that out. It, Dean Smith has kept a team in the Premier League. Daniel Farker hasn't. So fundamentally, there is a difference uh, in terms of those two coaches and their respective ability to win enough games in the Premier League to survive. So um, and and Villa, you know, wouldn't have been anywhere near relegation danger this time around. Uh, ultimately, he paid for, for his job because possibly couldn't he couldn't rise to the levels that they now feel as a club they want to go to in terms of Villa Park and obviously underlined by such a prior appointment to replace him in Steven Gerrard but yeah I just that is true but but also for me I think that you know ultimately four years is a very unusual length of time now for a, mo a coach in the modern game at the top end of the English game to be in post and you know there was a tiredness and, um, and a lethargy to the players that the, the football they were producing but also maybe to the head coach that you know what new could he have said to those players, the sunny the ones who'd been with him on that journey all the way along? You know, it did have a, f a feel of end of days, end of era mm. about it. Um, and that was reflective in a lot of the performances this season. But, you know, I go back to maybe not the first season under Daniel Farker, but certainly that first championship title winning season when everything we've discussed today already on this podcast about the Dean Smith side, high intensity and crowd fully behind them and just energy everywhere on and off the park that was a Daniel Farker team in the championship that first season so yes okay yeah that's a fair fair charge to lay at his door that you know he wasn't really up to the task in the Premier League but I, I think more for me it's about you know the time had come for a change and you know he'd, he'd probably you know ran its course him and Norwich City unfortunately for the personal human element of it all because um, what an unforgettable ride it was. But mm. I think there's no doubt now on the evidence of purely just these first two games that the same group of players under the stewardship of Dean Smith look far better equipped, whether that's tactically, whether that's what they're being coached to do, whether that's just the belief that's flowing through players like a Gilmore, like a Rashica now that we didn't see previously. Um, and all that culminates in performances and results that we've seen in the last two games. So, But... That's uh, you're right, absolutely spot on, Dave. That you know it is two games, and and really you could probably distill it to, yeah, okay, they were all right in the first half today, but it's really two halves of football, the two second halves. So 
this this consistency that we now need to see it's still very much a work in progress and you know if they're still maintaining what we're seeing in these first two games when we get to January having had 10 or 11 games under Smith then I think you have huge grounds for optimism going into the second half of the season yeah, well, they didn't go three games unbeaten in the Premier League under Farker. So if they can manage that at Newcastle, because I know they're three games unbeaten, but only two of them were Smith, weren't they? So if they can go a fourth game unbeaten overall, make it three under Smith, then, of course, that will ensure that Newcastle remain bottom and Norwich don't. Uh, but it will also show that they have definitely progressed. And um, we shall see that what the stat that stood out for me was that they had 84% pass completion today. That is the highest they've had since the first two games of the season in the Liverpool and Man City games. Uh, obviously, Man City is because they just basically didn't have the ball. <laughs> um, but Liverpool, one of the halves, was was good, wasn't it? So in recent weeks, that's been down in the 60s, which obviously was very low for the Farker regime as well. And um, the fact that they were just using the ball that bit better, I think, is a, is a big uh, encouragement. 14 shots, four on target, and Wolves only had five shots and two on target. So... That probably paints the picture that they felt that they uh, deserved. They should have uh, that they deserved to uh, to have won this game. Really, um, let's talk Milot Rashica, shall we? Well, we'll. I should say actually, we'll come back round to the club crest and the AGM and Stuart Webber. We'll, we'll sort of finish the pod on those sort of things. It's been a busy week, busy month, really, isn't it? Just so much going on all the time, and now we've got a real run of games, which I'm looking forward to just getting stuck in and talking about the football regularly all the time. To be perfectly honest, but me, like Rashid, so yeah, I think that was probably his best performance so far. Would you agree, Connor? And I, I sort of joked to you there was almost a, a little bit Huckabee esque, wasn't it, in the way he played? Yeah, I, I thought there was a, a period in the second half where. Well, pretty much when Norwich were on top, everything they seemed to be doing seemed to be going through Milo Rashica. And I think when when the uh, the board came up in the second half and it was his number that, that popped up, I think there were a few Wolves players who were pretty relieved to see that, to be <laughs> honest. Um, particularly Nelson Semedo was off the pitch at that point. He had a torrid afternoon, I think, mm. uh, against him. He, he caused in well, it was, it was pure chaos, really. But yeah, it, I, I mean, I, uh, I put out on my, on my social media, he's beginning to look like the player I think we all thought Norwich had signed in the summer. Someone who's direct, has pace, um, but also sort of an, an awareness and an ability to pe pick people out in the box. I think that was showcased in, in, in the second half when he pulled the ball back for Lucas Rupp, um, who, who obviously should have done better with, with the chance he had. But if Norwich can, and, and, and to be fair, I've been I've been thinking this in the last few weeks about Rashica that slowly we're beginning to see a, mm. um, a bit of improvement from him that was obviously um, sort of accelerated today but if he's someone uh, and we, we talk about consistency I mean he's he, he's someone that they need to get consistent performances out of because if they can then uh, they certainly look a, a better team going forward uh, and there, there seems a, a bit less of a reliance on, on, on Puki. Um, in, in terms of what they want to do from an attacking sense, if they can get him involved a little bit more. Now, the next challenge is, OK, well, can he add to his numbers? Can he get, can he contribute with a goal or, um, you know, create a goal, I suppose, as well? And uh, there were a couple of moments where his final decision wasn't quite there. But I think in, in terms of his overall game, he was um, he was as good as anyone on the pitch, I thought. Besides Rashica, Pad, who, who caught your eye? Um, the mayor was pretty pretty decent second yeah, half. He's, he's still running now, isn't he? Yeah, <laughs> I think I think I think I don't know. Last, I, I did, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and his bottle. Of, well, he definitely took something at half time. I'm joking, of course, but uh, I did joke to the head of comms. What exactly did he take at half time? Because uh, he was a, he was a man possessed, and I think much in the way you could argue Sargent coming in at the break against Southampton he kind of set the tone for that second half in terms of the energy and the athleticism and the willingness to press to me today it was McLean who was at the fulcrum of that in that second half and um, you know he was everywhere really and uh, yeah very very hard if he maintains those levels to leave him out of that midfield trio as it has been under Smith and uh, and as a result I think, think, I think we get, uh, again see what Gilmore can offer when he's got that protection around him, that kind of defensive protection. Um, so, yeah, for me, McLean, I think, was... A, I'd agree with Connor. I think I thought Rashid's are over the entirety was was very good. Um, I thought Max, I thought second half as well. Uh, Brandon Williams less so, but certainly Max was definitely on the front foot and obviously had a great chance in the first half, didn't he? But, um, no, it's good, it's good because you know, there's been too many games this season where... If we'd have had this debate, it'd be, well, I don't think any of them put their hand up. But now you're getting multiple performances. And ultimately, you, you boil it down. If Norwich are going to do anything this season, they need week to week 
pretty much the majority of their eleven playing as as or near to certainly their best efforts to get anything out of games at this level and um and we saw elements of that again today still you know plenty still to improve on no doubt about it uh, individually and collectively but um yeah no there's there's a real positivity now to to those Norwich players and you can see it it's running through that those players as well that they clearly have had a boost from from Smith and Shakespeare going in there and and almost a rejuvenative reset even though it was only 10 or 11 Premier League games in and they're off the back of what winning Daniel's last game but but they do they do look like different players and it's amazing the transformation in the space of essentially 180 minutes and that's what's so encouraging though isn't it as well that we're on the back of a a draw with Wolves and we're still sitting here saying they can do better than this there's still more to come and that was the hope when they got promoted wasn't it that this squad would be capable of maybe not even not just scraping to survival but they could even get into a little bit of mid-table if things went well but obviously we're not going to get carried away with uh, ourselves just yet there's a heck of a long way to go um I thought Gilmore probably his most consistent performance so far. Uh, he was certainly looking very bright. Then when Matthias Norman had to go off 35th minute, it was Gilmore that went into the deeper sort of anchor role and, and Rupp took over his place on sort of the right of the midfield three. And I thought that was probably Rupp's best Premier League performance as well for Norwich. Um, but uh, actually, if I bounce it back to you quickly, Pad, on, on Norman, um, what did Smith have to say about his injury? Uh, well, basically, if you recall, uh, in the last international period, Matthijs Norman was away with Norway. And I think for the first time, obviously, we knew he'd had this, this injection course sort of around the Burnley game. But he basically said on international duty, he'd torn a ligament in his pelvis. Um, it was essentially just managing it and playing through a lot of pain and, and, and very painful to sleep as well. But was able to get through games. Well, Dean Smith confirmed after the game, it's still this pelvic issue that he's dealing with. And that is a concern because if it's if it's a ligament tear and and essentially he's been trying to manage his body through it and his body has given up on him a little bit today, then it's not so much the Newcastle game because that probably will come too soon. We'll find out obviously a bit more in the next 24, 48 hours. But are we now going to be dealing with a situation with the rest of the season where until they, they can get him sorted, if that is at all possible from a sports science medical standpoint, are you going to have to manage Matthias Norman through games? Because... I think we've seen enough of him that, that if he's at full capacity, he's he's a very big asset and uh, take him out of the equation. And I know, yes, agreed, Lucas Rupp came in and d did a very decent job today, but you'd think they'd be a little bit light if you were reliant on him or uh, Lise Malou or maybe even the forgotten man, Jakob Sorensen. So um, that is a concern in the, big, in the bigger picture because he, he quite clearly has already established himself as quite a fulcrum in that midfield, Matthias Norman. So we'll wait and see. But, but ultimately, yeah, the pelvic issue he's been dealing with all season. The one change was the one we all expected. Sargent, as he'd come on for Campwell at half-time during the Southampton game, got the start back on the right. Todd didn't even get on the pitch in the end today. Jollis was the man that Smith turned to from the bench in terms of the attacking. What did you make of uh, of Sargent's performance, Connor? The the air shot was quite funny, wasn't it? In the second half, uh, sorry, first half, wasn't it? I, I felt a bit sorry for him because he was trying to take the shot early, wasn't he? But after what happened to him against Brighton earlier in the season, that's just the sort of thing he doesn't need. <laughs> yeah, he just can't catch catch a break, can he, for the goal? And I was I was uh, actually watching him during the the shooting drill and the warm up, and I think he put everyone in the back of the net. So yeah. <laughs> it just goes to show, doesn't it? When it comes to the uh, the real stuff, he's he's been a little bit unlucky. But yeah, I think. Uh, it was it was much like I think every every sort of performance we've seen from him so far in terms of his endeavour and work rate and work off the ball. He's, he's a very effective player when it comes to technically and um, sort of getting involved in, in in attacking elements. And as you said there, the the moments that matter just maybe lacking the, uh, a little bit of quality and. Um, that is is probably the next bit and, and that's kind of the trade-off isn't it because you go with Todd and you maybe get the technical side but maybe not the um, the work rate not that Todd doesn't work hard but just I think Sargent's maybe a, a, got a bit more intelligence off the ball and a bit is, is a bit more sort of backwards thinking than Todd is or on the flip side you have someone who does all of those elements but maybe doesn't have the technical sort of points that maybe Norwich City needs so that again is is probably a dilemma that, that I think will rumble on through through the next few weeks um because we've seen, obviously, last week the, the impact Sargent can have off the bench, um, particularly against tiring defences, and he looks a lot better when he has space to run in. Um, and, and he probably, I mean, I look at Norwich as a whole today, and, and, and the major differences, and 
we've spoken about them really are off the ball in terms of what they're trying to do and the structure they have and he he's a massive part of that I, I felt and particularly you know given given the quality that Wolves have in in those attacking areas in particular I think he, he he's, he's he's really important to have in that side um but equally as you said when it comes to the moments that matter the 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 time where he does need to take a shot earlier or there is a half chance or or, or there is a, a an opportunity it just doesn't quite seem to be quite there yet um which is probably why we're seeing him play as uh, as a right winger as opposed to a to a striker i think so yeah i mean the still still work to do with him he's, he's, he's still incredibly young i think physically he's there's there's a lot good to work with um and it's it's up to smith in the weeks to come i think to to, to find a tune out of him technically because I think that's probably where the question marks still lie. He probably just needs one of those dirty goals, doesn't he? You know, when it just falls for him kindly at a corner or something like that. He does have four goals to his name this season. He scored twice for Bremen in Bundesliga 2 and then twice in that. was twice, wasn't it, in the Bournemouth game in the League Cup? Yeah. So um, he has got four goals to his name uh, at club level this year, which is the same as Pukki. It's just none of them are in the Premier League, are they? And he did really work hard again. Same as Pukki. It's just they... they the quality wasn't quite there that you needed that's that's what they're going to be judged on isn't it the, the sharp end of things and but you the way they both led the press at high up the pitch really really did uh, work nicely and that they were important parts of the team effort grant hanley's probably the one who came away with uh, any worries about his place i still don't think he'll lose it particularly up at newcastle away from home against one of his old clubs but there obviously are a lot of people who are big fans of omar bamadeli feel that for the second time this season, he's been unfortunate to, to lose his starting role. I think the thing with Grant, because there was good stuff in there again, wasn't there today? Him and Gibson did go through a great deal of work. You know that Grant's going to be good in the air. That's generally where he is. His problem today really is that they were unforced errors, weren't they? The the mistake which put Krill under pressure, the bad pass which created the uh, which gave away a corner, even the Jimenez chance early on, he'd been beaten to the punch really, hadn't he? So how do you see Hanley's situation shaping up, Pat? He's just, he's just got to cut out those unforced errors, basically, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, interestingly, Dean Smith explaining that logic of, of that, you know, how he how he arrived at Gibson and, and Hanley for Southampton his first game, and Obama Daly on the bench, and Ozanka back again, uh, same similar this weekend, not even in the in the matchday squad. Um, and it was it was very clear in Dean Smith's mind. He wanted the experience. He wanted obviously the right left combination. That you know, with Gibson, you get that balance. But very much erred on the side of for him central defensively experience and and has gone with that again today. But pressed him again on Friday last. Um, you know about Omar Bamadeli and, and Kabak and 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 Dean Smith was under in in, in no doubt and wants them two who are currently in possession under no illusions if their levels drop. He's more than happy to to you know turn to a maybe on my daily before Kabak, given he's not making the match day squads. But who's still nineteen? We shouldn't forget on my daily. He's yeah, so young, isn't yeah, frightening. <laughs> but you know we've seen we've seen him at every stage for club and for country for the republic. That he just looks totally unflustered and believes he belongs at this level. And uh, you know it's frightening maturity from such a young man. And uh, mm. there's no there's no shadow of a doubt that. Grant Hanley does need to sharpen up, definitely. You know, you could maybe put last week down to the fact he did miss two or three weeks with the injury that was enough to leave him out of the Scotland setup for that international period. But, um, yeah, if either of those drop their levels, then, you know, I'm pretty sure under this guy, there'll be no sentiment shown, even if it is your captain, even if it is one of the leaders. But... I think on balance, I mean, ultimately, those two again have been part of a, a defence A that kept a clean sheet and B, uh, another uh, another unbeaten game. So I think on balance, Dean Smith will probably look at it for Newcastle, certainly, and I don't think he'd look to make a change. I thought Gibson was good again today. Mm -hmm. He's really uh, he's really blossoming now when, yeah. you know, certainly the Leicester game sticks in my head. It, you had reservations about, is he a Premier League quality defender? Because he got a bit exposed that day. But I think... Now we're starting to see Brentford as well. He was excellent that day, and and then these first two games under Smith, that you know, his anticipation, his ability to read the game, some of the sort of trigger moves to you know crosses that were coming into the box, and he'd be the first to meet it as well. I think um, yeah, he's he's looking very comfortable at this level now, and it's great to see. But uh, yeah, there's no doubt about it. You know, with Hanley, you just fear there's a rick in him at the minute, and um, he needs to you know pretty swiftly get past that. Otherwise these type of debates will only grow and, and ultimately you know there are options now for Dean Smith uh, as he alluded to on Friday 
yeah, you've got two 21 year old fullbacks there, haven't you? I think having a 19 year old centre back in between them as well just really does potentially tip the balance a bit too much. And yeah, I think Gibson's in a real rhythm now. He's looking more like the player of last season. And it's interesting, we're going up to Newcastle again Tuesday night. I remember speaking to him after the pre season game there, which is just after the sort of COVID crisis in the squad. And they, uh, they lost 3 0. They were pretty abject that day, weren't they? They were just running on fumes, really. And that day, I'd, it had been quite concerning when I spoke to him that he said that his ankle still wasn't feeling like his ankle. He still wasn't really feeling fit. But now he just looks like he's more comfortable in himself and he's he's stepping out with the ball a little bit more. And yeah, hopefully, that, again, there's there's more to come from him. And I think Hanley is capable of cutting out those those errors as well because um, he's probably had been a little bit lucky. You know, he had the goal to mask things a little bit last week. And, you know, his mistakes haven't necessarily been punished in the way that they probably should have been if you were playing Salah or something they would have been um so yeah he's he's survived this little awkward patch now he's got to do what Gibson's doing and find that rhythm um what do you make of Brandon Williams as as well Connor he's um well he certainly doesn't shirk a tackle or anything does he no you can tell he's from a boxing background can't you I think that's uh <laughs> that's that's what um what I kind of think of when I watch him he, he play he, he's quite a throwback in many mm. ways he's quite a um uh, an old-fashioned left-back, I suppose. Well, Pat had a good comparison here, <laughs> if you want to say it. <laughs> Go on. Well, he looks like him, I reckon. Uh, Ex-Cov, ex-Forest, Stuart Pearce, psycho. We'll have to start calling him psycho. Yeah. Psycho yeah. Williams. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, that, 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 that he be... liked to tackle, let me tell you. <laughs> he certainly did. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's got a bit of a bite about him, which which I like. I thought, actually, uh, and, uh, and again, we, we mentioned players who kind of under Smith look, look to be heading in, in the right direction. I think he's a he's another one. Um, uh, we speak about consistency again. I think we're beginning to see a, a little bit of, of that again. And this is a guy who's, who's played for Manchester United in, in, in the Premier League, in the Champions League. Uh, we saw how good he was against Norwich at Old Trafford a couple of years ago. Um, he, he, he was when, when you see players like that play for a, a big club and put in a pretty decent performance you tend to kind of memorize their name a little bit and he was one that I jotted down not, not physically but um, mentally that day um, and yeah I think I think we've seen now a series of performances that show his quality um, I think he's, he's probably better defensively than Dimitris Yanoulis but maybe doesn't have the attacking edge that he does but by the same token if we're talking about Milo Rashica and unlocking him and he's going to play on the left-hand side then actually maybe that's the better balance to strike for Dean mm. Smith to have a winger who's really direct and wants to get at people and then a full-back who can cover him if he, if he wants to do that and, and he's not going to try and overlap him and take his space and um, so so yeah that balance could be one to watch over the over the next few weeks but um, yeah I think in terms of the left-back debate I, I don't think it really is a debate at the moment I think it's it, it's Brandon Williams's shirt to lose at the minute uh, I think Dean Smith will, will feel the same after his first two performances. Well, how many times did we see goals coming down Norwich's left side in the opening 10 matches? I think, um, well, Farker had lost his tether with you know, this certainly to a certain extent, hadn't he? He was, you know, hauled off in the Man City and, and Chelsea games at, at half time. So it feels like just the whole left side, really, not rather than just Williams over you knew this. Um, because I don't think you'd want to write off your new list totally. He's a Greek international and stuff. But, you know, Gibson, Williams, Rashitza, they're working as a unit almost on their left side. And McLean, I suppose, is generally over that way as well. So they've got that bit of balance at the moment. And, and that's that's very helpful to see. Um, let's just finally on the game then go through sort of the, the three big chances, really. Um, Pad, you've already mentioned the Max one just before half time. Gilmore spreads it to the right. Aaron's darts inside. Nice one two with Rupp and then just the keeper to beat. And Saar spreads himself, makes a good save, really. Max should probably be be putting it away. He tries to put it for his legs, really, doesn't he? And that would have been a brilliant time to score just before half time. Um, the other one, Pad, was um, when Rupp, lovely little pass through through to Pukki. And we, we watched the replay back. He, he, he had time, didn't he? He did, he did. Clearly, he didn't feel he had time because it was a very uh, rushed attempt. And, and you could see, and you, you anybody watch it back on the replay, that he could have even took a touch and tried to go around the keeper. You know, he must have felt Saar was pretty much on top of him. Um, and I guess, you know, if you, if you look at it in terms of the angles, he's clearly looking maybe to his right just to see the, the tra trajectory of the rock pass and... And obviously Sars coming from his left, so if he'd had maybe that more peripheral vision, I'm sure he would have definitely had his chance again. He wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have tried to toe poke it. Um, 
maybe, maybe, maybe in his defence, he thought you know the act uh, act of surprise by getting it away early. But uh, no, it was another good save from the keeper. Um, and there was another one, Dow. Well, <laughs> Dow. There was a better chance for Rob, obviously, which you touched on, Dave. But uh, Dow whipped in a lovely ball, and again, he's he's on the stretch, and it's just come off his toenail and just slipped wide. So one of those days, like Dean Smith said, another day. You know, he comes off the pitch with a brace, but I'm liking what I'm seeing from that man now. I, I think, um, you know, his general effervescence, really, and his energy is is as good as, as we've seen for a while and how they've got that out of him because he looked a tired player in some of those games uh, under Farker this season and he just thought, are there too many miles on the clock? But certainly these first two games, he's been... I it's hard to say back to his best because at his best he's been a prolific goal scorer but um, he's definitely carrying, carrying a goal threat and, and he's so important so important to this Norwich team now we talked about Sargent he's he's not the finished article by a long way in terms of goal scoring Rashid yes promising signs but not adding the end product he's still really if you, if you had to put your life on who you would rely on to get you a goal in that Norwich setup, it's Timu Puki still so um not today, not to be today, but uh, yeah, positive signs, and uh, and they need to to keep him in that vein because if they do, over the entirety, you think he's going to score a few goals. Hopefully, if they continue to create the chances, they are. Yeah, he looks happy and focused at the moment, and I think uh, if um, if he didn't get to double figures this season, if he can just stay fit and and the way things are going for him at the moment, I'd, I'd be disappointed for him because I think he's um, I think he's probably heading in the right direction. Um, we shall see. As, there was also that the rough chance, of course, yes, as we as we mentioned, where he just didn't, he scuffed it through to the keeper, really. Again, it was Rashid that created it. Um, and there was a lovely pass from Dowell as well, which Pookie couldn't quite get to. It was almost a, like a golf chip, wasn't it? And he just didn't quite get enough backspin on it once it had got onto the green. And, and Pookie couldn't quite catch up with it. But um, Dowell... A couple of times lost the ball a bit too cheaply, but you know he did show that he's got the technical ability on the ball in that sort of late cameo. But um, yes, lots to uh, lots to enjoy. Welcome to the new normal. Hello, and welcome to this series of unfinished with me, Charles Thompson. Welcome to Weird Norfolk. Welcome to this week's edition of the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast. From true crime to football, politics to folklore, for more great podcasts from Archant, head to audioboom.com forward slash channel forward slash Archant. Right, the new crest, the modernised version of the crest, which is just about 50 years old, 1972. Connor, we were... Lucky enough to have a look at this a couple of months ago, weren't we, as part of the club's um, consultation, which, to be fair to them, has been very thorough from everyone, from academy kids right up to Grant Hanley, Delia Smith. They've uh, spoken to just about everyone they could. There was a, a room full of supporters who were asked for their thoughts on it on the night we were there, weren't they? So just sort of talk us through it all. I don't think it's gone... Like from the club's point of view, I don't think it's gone too badly, really, is it? Yeah, well, the, the fact we managed to get through the whole AGM, which we'll come on to later, <laughs> yeah. without a single question about uh, about it, probably shows um, the general feeling towards it. Of course, we had a poll on our website as well, which I think about mm. two and a half thousand people voted in, and, and the vast majority were, were either they liked it, thought it was okay, or weren't particularly bothered by it. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's very much kind of evolution, not revolution, isn't it? And I, and I think maybe... The view I took when I when I saw it a couple of months ago, um, when when we went to that evening, um, I was a bit bit unsure to begin with, to be honest. Uh, and then since obviously they've launched it and I've seen it again, I, I've actually probably liked it a lot more actually this week than perhaps I did when I first saw it two months ago. So maybe that's an indication that it's a little bit of a grower. But yeah, when when, when you kind of sit down, and you think about the reasons for doing it and the fact they want to. Um, sort of digital or bring it into the in line with the digital age the fact that they're one of four clubs who haven't refreshed their badge since uh, since the turn of this century then then I think you know there's a lot of reasons for doing it I think for me it was just please don't change it too much I mean we saw some of the other versions which were um, <laughs> more extreme <laughs> yeah so, some of them were horrendous I mean they, they were um, pre-evolution soccer-esque if anyone's ever played that it was uh, yeah not great so the fact they've ended up here is is probably good. I mean, to be honest, I, I don't know if anyone's seen that Alan Partridge gift where he kind of shrugs his shoulders. I'm a bit I'm a bit like that towards it. To be honest, it's it, it's fine, and um, I think anyone really angry about it probably um, 
probably needs to maybe, I don't know, um, I don't want to say get out a bit more because that's, that's maybe not the right <laughs> term, but uh, I don't think it's anything to get too worked up about, put it that way. No, I think any um, adult who gets that worked up about a slight modernisation of a badge probably does have a bit of a problem, to be honest, because I don't really think that it's well they haven't changed the design it's the same design it's just been modernized and i i would i think it makes perfect sense and i think 50 years is more than long enough for that design which will always be fondly remembered and has its place in in club history you know it was um, well i don't know if it was this exact building i don't know if the eastern evening news would have been based here in 1972 off the top of my head to be honest i think it might have been by then i think i think it was the 60s they Thanks moved so. here wasn't it so it was the eastern evening news that ran a competition um andrew anderson was the architect who designed it wasn't he and it basically combined the traditional norwich coat of arms with with a canary and it's certainly served its purpose it's not been binned off anyway it's just been modernized isn't it and i think uh, a lot of sense it, it, it makes a lot of sense and I, I remember that night when we first saw it the build-up it was almost like oh here we go and everyone, everyone was just waiting to be like oh my gosh what have you done and then it came up on the screen and it was like, oh okay that's that's fine you, you, that's not really that different is it um and the biggest thing and i mean it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on this pad really because as, as somebody that ha didn't grow up around norwich city and it you know it, it's not there's no emotional tie for you to that badge or that crest at all is there that you know i've seen that crest my entire life and i can't i don't think i'd ever paid attention to the lion supposed lion <laughs> as, as it was somebody there um at the consultation said well it was always described to me as like a floaty ghost <laughs> and then i'd looked at it it barely looked like a lion so that's that's what sums it up for me is that it was a hand-drawn version which won a newspaper competition in 1972 it's served its time it's done 50 years and now they've brought it into the digital age so what was your sort of thoughts on it didn't have one single thought on that badge <laughs> at all i've even looked Couldn't at it yeah, <laughs> i have looked at it and to be fair yeah with my non-norwich city fan hat on uh the lion is the standout because that wasn't a lion on that original badge. I don't know what that was. I'll tell you what it looks like. You know um, those kind of big floaty things they feel were there? Oh, yeah, like in Family Guy. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah it, looks, it looks a bit yeah. like that. So, I mean, ultimately, what have they done but, um, you know, modernised the existing... It's the existing design, just modernised, isn't it? And, and slight tweaks, you know, in terms of the maybe some of the fonts. Um, but, yeah, no, it's just... Uh, well, I mean, the reaction would tell you the fact that there hasn't been some sort of course there was going to be, you know, as soon as talk of badge changing. And then you can imagine uh, the flutters that were set alight a, a on social media. But I think ultimately now, two, three, four days on, nobody's talking about it, are they? No. So um, so we can move on now, safely put that behind us. The one um, set of people that I maybe feel a little bit um, sorry for are the people who've got a tattoo. <laughs> But I'd spin that in a positive if I was them and say, well, you know, it shows longevity. I, this was, I, w I was there when this was the badge. So in 20 years when their son or grandson or whatever, granddaughter says, oh, what's that? Oh, that's what the Norwich City badge used to be. That's what it was when we were in the, uh, when we won the Milk Cup in 85 or when we won the championship title two years in, two times in three years, that sort of thing. Um, to more serious matters, though, it was the AGM Thursday night. We heard more about Stuart Webber's contract. Uh, we were there, Connor, <laughs> frantically trying to keep up with everything because there's a lot of ground covered in the AGM. You were on the live updates, weren't you? And it finally got round to Stuart's contract. Someone finally asked him about it. And uh, even then, he sort of built it up a little bit, and he sort of started talking about something else before he came back round to it. <laughs> and Phil Daly from Radio Norfolk was sat next to us, and I sort of looked at him and went, you know, like when people in the crowd used to go, oh, because they wanted the Farker waves. I sort of waved my fingers in his direction because we knew what was coming. But yes, it finally got confirmed that Stuart is staying. Yeah, which is... Um which is what we we all thought was was going to be the case it's been a bit of an open secret hasn't it i think yeah. since, since he since he done his media before that before that leeds game and um you know as, as he explained on the night it would have been very difficult for him to have taken the decision that he had to take on daniel farker if uh if he if he didn't know himself what he was going to do because uh, again as, as dean smith referenced i think on, on friday if it, it was one of the first questions he asked him when when stuart went to his house to interview him as as any candidate would i think because you're hardly going to sign up to a project um where your boss could be leaving in six months time yeah. it, it doesn't make sense for anyone so um 
yeah, positive on on that front. Um, I think obviously he he he's, he said he didn't really like the the hoo ha around his his last contract and the fact it was fixed, which was to bring him in line as uh, as Zoe Ward says with Daniel Farker. Uh, I know some people again will question the stability around the rolling contract, but. Um, that will uh, essentially, well, it's essentially what both parties wanted. I think it's, it's the contract he had when he came in initially. It gives them a bit of flexibility to do it. Obviously, there'll be um, a notice period within that. Should he decide that he does want to, he does want to leave. I think the most interesting, um, excuse me, snippet on the night was how he said that he he, he thought that his next job wouldn't be in football, yeah. which is I'm surprised um, he said it. Yeah, which is something that he's he's, he's not said before. So. Um, you know, as, as me and Pad spoke about on Friday, you don't really get the impression that that's going to be outside of, of sport. We know he's a massive F1 fan. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that, that for me was probably the most interesting element of it all. Obviously, he wants to go and work abroad as well, which he said. So, um, yeah, good news for, for Norwich, I think. And, and, you know, there is unfinished business here. He hasn't quite established... Well, uh, do you ever establish a team in the Premier League? But not quite gotten over the hurdle of, uh, of keeping Norwich City in the Premier League, which no one has done now for, for nearly a decade. Uh, there's there's plenty of work still to do in in terms of Carroll Road, in terms of the infrastructure at Colney. They've obviously got a new set of plans that they want to put into place there when, when the time allows. So I, I think he sees enough here at the moment to um, to keep him occupied. For, for certainly the next uh, the next period of time, which you obviously will be um, will be with Dean Smith in the dugout, and, and it gives Norwich City a bit of stability beyond next summer. That, irrespective of whether it's Premier League survival or if it, it is another season in the Championship, it's going to be Stuart Weber as sporting director and Dean Smith as head coach. Mm. It'll be interesting when the time becomes appropriate again to to talk to him more about that. You know, is that a case of he's just a bit sick of the football circus? Because he seems to me like someone who, if he did step out of football, that quite quickly he might miss it. Um, I, I don't know. Football is is a bit of a mad world, isn't it? And I remember well, the three of us were all sat in that room, weren't we, when we spoke to him about after he signed his new contract in 2019. They just beat in Manchester City a few days before and he signed for 2022 and he sort of dropped the bombshell on his end, didn't he? That This will be it. I'm going in 2022. I want to go on to a new challenge. We've heard him say on the Jake Humphrey podcast, haven't we, that he wants to climb Everest and raise a million pounds for charity. And he's got all these personal ambitions beyond football. He's a young man. He's only 37, isn't he? He's achieved a great deal in his life already. His, his, the way he's climbed the the football ladder is is incredibly impressive in in many ways but the big thing that we didn't know sitting there that day was that what a little more than six months later football would be shut down society would be pretty much shut down because of a pandemic which is still very much not over yet and we're you know still wearing masks and it sounds like mask wearing is going to become more widespread and stuff pretty quickly we're all worrying about this variant in south africa and all that sort of stuff so the the vibe really pad from from what he was saying is that if the pandemic hadn't have happened he feels like they would be, have made a lot better progress than they had made and when you consider they managed to bounce back to the premier league and, and everything that they have achieved despite a 30 million loss zoe mentioned it as well actually didn't they, in the interview with you connor that that they've always got this little nagging thing in their head now that what if covid hadn't happened yeah. Well, he's referenced that. I've definitely done interviews with him where there's an underlying sense of frustration that, that almost the handbrake has had to be applied to whether it was more ambitious plans with the squad or Colney or the speed of some of the infrastructural stuff they want to do. All of that, unfortunately, um, had to take a much slower pace than certainly Stuart Webber would have liked to have if it wasn't for a... How do you plug a thirty million pound at thirty million pounds for a self-funded mm. club? It's a remarkable state of affairs that you know the recent set of accounts showed based on the player trading which he he has overseen, and of course Daniel in the role he played in terms of developing those those gems. But uh, you know the numbers are frightening, and where would Norwich be now if if they hadn't embarked on this path of developing players that they could? obviously initially help their own first team but thereafter you know reach saleable values where they could offset a 30 million pound hole which um as you rightly say from an event that nobody could have foreseen but the fact that an unforeseen event came along and norwich have still come out the side in that side in a very robust and financially healthy state is well it's um it's 
it's an amazing testament to Stuart Webber's work because ultimately, yes, it's not just down to him, but he is the person who came in in 2017, was tasked with overseeing this really bold departure from what had gone before on and off the pitch, all areas of the club, um, and to drive that through. And, and it probably it was going to take somebody of his relatively tender age to have the energy and the passion and the vision to do that. And um, I just think, uh, just backtracking slightly about his next move, I, I think this must have taken such a huge amount out of him and maybe the relentlessness of it because really ultimately the book stops with him as was proven with the simple choice of getting rid of Daniel Farker you know that ultimately was Stuart Webber's call gets the gets the sign off from the board but then he has to deliver that call as well and to be making those decisions on a daily weekly basis you know I could I could easily foresee a scenario at some point now into the future, given he's made this commitment that he's going to stay around for the for the seeable, you know, maybe just think, I just can't work at this pace for the rest of my working life. You know, I need to get out of this. And of course, you know, there may be other more de other demanding sporting environments he, he jumps into, but probably nothing quite to the scale of what he's had to face because of a pandemic, because of inheriting a club that was a bit of a basket case in terms of the finances and an ageing squad and you know, all that weight of expectancy, yet they were, you know, really configured to probably go the other way. And dare I say, you know, you look at clubs like Ipswich and Leeds before they came back and Forest and all these clubs have slid into League One and, and worse. Um, that's where that club, this club was heading. And now, yes, of course, on the pitch, they face a huge challenge to stay up. But in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of the foundation and the building blocks, um, this club is in very, very secure hands and, and that really is Stuart Webber's abiding legacy. So, you know, in it's it's a good good news that he's staying, but, um, you know, I, I just think that, you know, probably uh, it, it's unrealistic to think he's going to be here for another five years or whatever. He's been here now four or five years. Uh, I just don't see that, but he will go when the time's right for him and hopefully also for Norwich and 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 if if he's left them in the if he's going on his terms then you can be sure that Norwich are probably going to be in the Premier League and financially in a very enviable position. So um I would imagine he will he will want to leave them in that state and that whoever he passes the baton on to is inheriting well, a completely different type of scenario to the one he took on in twenty seventeen. Yeah, I think a great emotional toll, probably, and even the the decision to have to sack Daniel that cannot have been easy. With how well he has spoken about it a bit, isn't he? That they were so close. He he said that Daniel was probably the person he spoke to most in his life. Which, given that I don't know if he includes Zoe in that, you know, <laughs> given that they she also works at the club and and obviously is his wife, but you know, with Daniel it was literally day to day. Whereas Zoe's based at Carrow Road, isn't she? She I don't think. She, she she'll be at Colney most days. They probably do work quite separately a lot of the time, and then they come together on certain certain pros, uh, projects. You've got to think that the the dream end goal would be Premier League stability. Here's the plan for rebuilding the city stand. Here's my successor. I've handpicked him. He's the hot prospect sporting director. I think he's going to be the man to take things on for me. I'm off to go and lie down in a dark room for, for a few <laughs> months and and decompress from football. Then I'm going to climb Everest. Then I'm going to go and work at Red Bull for a couple of years in F1. Then I'm going to raise my money for charity. And he could come back to football. You know, it would still be there for him. And maybe even if he'd achieved those things, the longer he was out of the game, the more his stock would rise and the great offers he would get. What, what really intrigues me with it is what if that offer comes along? What if Leicester next summer come to him and say, Stuart, you're the man that we want to become our sporting director and take us to the Champions League next year and things, would he be able to resist if, for instance, he'd kept Norwich up this season and the, the decision to bring Smith in works out and all those sort of things? There's there's a lot of water to flow under this bridge. This season could still turn bad. It could still not work out. They could still have a bad relegation. And it turns out that next summer is the time to, to part ways and that um, in the same way that We've talked about the the fresh ideas of a head coach, just a, a fresh voice coming in. That maybe it would come to the, the natural end next next summer. We shall see. But the one thing we can be sure of, and as we know all f full well from being fortunate enough to be in so many interviews with him, is that it's rarely dull when Stuart Webber's around. He's always got a good so sound bite for uh, for us, and he 
you know, says things as as he sees them. He's quite happy to to say the the tough words and to rile fans and and just say what he thinks. So uh, we should value that side of things as well. Just to finish with uh, the other bits and pieces of the AGM, Connor. We're, again, um, you spoke to Zoe Ward. That's on our YouTube channel. You can listen to that interview in in full. But there were other bits and pieces, including on the stadium and and safe standing and stuff, weren't there? Yeah, I think for me, probably the, the most interesting point was on investment. Uh, that, that's obviously a, a topic that comes up at the AGM quite frequently. Um, that was, again, put to the board about kind of external investment. And it's the first time I've, uh, I think I've heard for a while that actually they, they, they wouldn't act, actively consider it at this stage and that there had been inquiries, but um, it was about kind of vetoing them and then putting them to Delia and Michael and whatnot. And not a lot of those are genuine. And um, so, so that was quite interesting. Yeah, the, the bit on, on, on... I'll just cut in there. Bob. Sorry to interrupt, but before we move on to other things, it wasn't put directly to Delia and Michael, was it? Nobody in that room directly addressed Delia and Michael. What's going on with your shares? What's your plan? What's the succession plan, the exit plan, whatever? Um, where's where's the future? Because we haven't had that laid out publicly for quite a while now, have we? You know, that a few years ago, it was that the, their shares would eventually go to, to Tom. But we haven't actually had an update on that for quite a long time. But the fact that it wasn't directly put to Delia and Michael suggests that those shareholders in that room weren't worried about that. Yeah, yeah, which again is interesting in itself, isn't it? Um, and I mean, we know that they're they're not data. They don't run the club day to day. They they give people plenty of autonomy to do their job. Some might say that's a an incredible strength. Um, I think at times it's also been a weakness. So uh, again, it, it's probably dependent on how ultimately results are going on the pitch, isn't it? But yeah, that, that again, the fact that question wasn't asked is interesting. I mean, they're, they're both, what, 80 now? So, mm. um, you know, it's it, it's going to become a very real conversation at some point. Um, and and we, you'd like to think, given the, the long-term planning that Norwich do from a sporting side, that that's, that's similar as well from, from, that, from that perspective. Yeah, I, I mean, other interesting bits was the redevelopment of the stadium. Again, that seems to be on the agenda every year. Um, Zoe said that, that they had kind of um, conversations with external companies about what that would look like. Obviously, two years ago, we had Ben Kensel coming out and saying that they'd bought plot, mm. uh, sort of plots of land around Carrow Road that would essentially enable them to, to build on it. This is now about well, what would the project look like? And essentially, similarly to Colney, it's about having a plan in place. So if they do sell a player for £50 million and that pot of money becomes available they can push the button and, and go ahead with it uh, and then yeah safe standing probably the other one as well there's obviously trials going on in um, I think in the new year at yeah. uh, a, a handful of Premier League clubs and a couple of championship clubs I think with kind of the the, the feeling that the legislation on that is going to change next summer um, Norwich have already sort of began consulting I, I think uh, she said along come Norwich and Buckley and Norwich have, um, have been consulted on that logistically it's quite difficult because you then have to look at it and go, OK, well, if you're going to put it in this area of the stadium, the current season ticket holders, would they want it? Um, how many would they need to sort of reaccommodate elsewhere? Um, the cost of it is is also a factor. So there's um, and, and then, of course, you have to factor that into kind of the season renewal programme. So there's kind of a lot of uh, hoops you need to jump through in, in order to reach that point. But uh, and again, same with the city stand, because uh, ultimately, given the large proportion of season ticket holders that the club have, you can't then get rid of a stand and, <laughs> and move season ticket holders elsewhere because there's not the space. So, um, yeah, it's, it's logistical challenges more than anything I think they face. It's, it's almost a blessing and a curse having the um, sheer amount of season ticket holders that they do have. Um, so, yeah, I think those are both kind of very mid to long term elements to keep an eye out for. But um, interesting that the club have, uh, have began at least in a very, very, very early phase to, to kind of get the wheels in motion on both of them. Lovely job. Thank you, boys. Thank you very much for listening and for joining us. We'll get this out to you nice and quickly because Tuesday night there's another game. The four of us, or the three of us, along with Adam, our video man, will be up at St James's Park at Newcastle Tuesday night for, uh, well, for the, bat the, the battle of the bottom two, officially. But um, it would be nice if Norwich could cut them adrift, wouldn't it? The richest club in the world adrift at the bottom of the Premier League. And they are three points adrift as we talk. So uh, that's a nice position. But clearly Norwich can start making some real inroads. If they could get a win there, it would be a heck of a result and would really uh, set some alarm bells ringing up on Tyneside as well. Uh, we will, of course, uh, bring you all of our usual content 
content from there. So uh, Monday morning will be Dean Smith's preview co uh, press conference, but we'll uh, we'll have the six things. We'll have Paddy's verdict. We'll have all the all the usual stuff. And uh, keep it locked on Pinkin.com this week because we've uh, we've got some exciting stuff coming your way. So I'll just drop a little 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 teaser in there for you. Uh, we'll keep keep the eyes uh, eyes peeled. Um, on the Adam Buxton podcast, he calls them the quartermasters I, I can't remember the exact statistic but most people that listen to podcasts don't get to the final quarter of a podcast they normally have moved on to something else by then because it's, people... it's long before them of us <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i'm sure after uh, you did your receipts a bit <laughs> <laughs> um yeah to the dozen of you that are still listening at this point yeah um but yeah we, we've got a little project that we're working on which we're, we're hoping to be able to uh, bring you lots more on in the weeks ahead so that'll do for now thank you very much for listening and we'll catch up with you very soon